let's talk about quantum secure cryptocurrencies or these alleged ones. There's been a lot of chatter about quantum computing maybe destroying Bitcoin, and even I've made a video about it. Quantum computers are really effective against elliptic curve encryption and RSA encryption. While Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies don't really use RSA encryption, they do use elliptic curve digital signature algorithm, which controls whether you can actually spend your coins. But in short, for Bitcoin, the problem is, is that the public key is exposed anytime a transaction is made. It can actually be used to sign transactions, and potentially with a big enough quantum computer, we could reverse that calculation and get the private key from the public key. You use that private key to sign the transaction, say, yes, I approve this. So anyone that has your private key, if they could reverse it with a quantum computer, could pretend they're you and sign these transactions away, even though you don't want them to. And there are new cryptocurrencies coming out that say they're quantum safe or quantum secure, meaning that they can stand up to attacks, known attacks from a quantum computer. So today I'm going to analyze the claims of these cryptocurrencies. Now I'm not going to parse through all the code and see if the actual implementation is correct, but I'm really going to look at the concepts and the claims that these cryptocurrencies make. And the ones I'm going to cover here are some of the more popular ones, and they're actually going to cover more of the signature schemes. So for example, the Winternet's one-time signature or Watts and the extended Merkle signature scheme. So I'll talk about those two a lot. And honestly, I'm going to focus on these two because I started researching this video and I realized I was writing like a full length dissertation on all these topics and I had to cut it down somehow. So that's why we're going to focus on these two right now. So I'm definitely going to make a part two to this video. So make sure to subscribe and like this video if you want to see more of that. And remember, I'm not a cryptocurrency expert and I'm not an expert in altcoin marketing. I'm purely approaching this from the quantum computing side and analyzing these claims. So this is not investment advice. Do your own research with the cryptocurrencies and only invest what you're willing to lose, just like any other investment. And if you stay till the end, I'll show you my new updated cryptocurrency portfolio. So number one, I want to cover QRL. QRL is the quantum resistant ledger. And obviously I want to start with this one because it has quantum right in the name. Quantum resistance has been a North star for this cryptocurrency from the very beginning. So on their website, they say, QRL is the first industrial implementation to utilize the IETF specified XMSS, which is this Merkle signature that I talked about, a hash-based forward secure signature scheme with minimal security assumptions and reusable addresses that come with NIST approval. Let's break that down. So they say here that quantum security is built in from the Genesis block. So it's always been the case that QRL has been built with non-elliptic curve digital signatures, unlike Bitcoin. So what is XMSS? This is this extended Merkle signature scheme. They consist of a couple of components. So a one-time signature, OTS, and a method for creating a single long-term public key from this large set of OTS keys. XMSS uses the Winternet's one-time signature scheme. So Watts generates 32 random numbers, which are 256 bits each. And for each random number, we hash it 256 times using, say, SHA-256. This becomes our private key. So this can also be used with different hash functions. Even though I said SHA-256 here, you can also use it with SHAKE-256. So what's a Merkle tree? A Merkle tree is also called a hash tree. So there's a parent node and children nodes below it that are linked. For a Merkle tree, the non-leaf nodes, with the leaf node being a node that does not have a child, is labeled with a hash of the data block, and every non-leaf node is labeled with a hash of the labels of its child nodes, so it's hashing the hash. The cool thing about XMSS is because it uses these Merkle trees, the hash itself can actually be very short compared with the data sizes, which makes it really efficient. So to create the hash tree, the public keys are hashed once in the leaves of the node, and then they're hashed together in pairs going up to the tree until we get to the top node. And that will be used as the long-term public key. Now here on the QRL website, it says NIST approved, and that's true in some ways. So it's an approved standard for stateful hash-based signature schemes. However, that recommendation is not based on quantum computing, and NIST is actually going through its own process right now to do post-quantum recommendations. And those recommendations right now kind of lay in the family of multivariate error-correcting codes and lattice-based cryptography. So the results haven't been released yet, so we'll see if NIST actually decides this is one of the approved signature schemes in the post-quantum world. It does seem the hash-based schemes so far are secure against quantum computers, but NIST is expected to make multiple recommendations in the report. But you might say Grover's algorithm, it could potentially weaken hash-based schemes. That's true to some extent. First of all, Grover's algorithm is not as devastating as speedup. It's a quadratic speedup and not exponential. That means for something like AES-256 encryption, it'd be actually equivalent after a quantum computer to AES-128. 
And it hasn't actually been shown yet that Grover's algorithm could be used for solving SHA-256 problems. Plus, there are collision attacks that classical systems can do that are actually much better than a quadratic speedup. So we really shouldn't compare Grover's algorithm to just the classic serialized search. We should really compare it to the best case scenario in classical computing. So it's really not a danger. And still, there's a couple tricks to Grover's algorithm. We still don't know whether it's going to be good at these sort of problems. It might not help it at all. And even then, the classical computing attacks are stronger. As we were expecting, the quantum resistant ledger is actually built in mind with quantum security and using pretty good candidates like this Watts and XMSS schemes. And remember those because you'll see them coming up in some of these other cryptocurrencies. Now let's talk about Machimo. So they say on their website, in three to five years, quantum computing is poised to break ESDCA encryption, leaving Bitcoin, Ethereum, and all ERC-20 tokens unsafe for transactions and as a store of value. I personally do not think we can get to a point in quantum computers where we could break RSA or elliptic curve encryption in three to five years. Also, I don't know when this website was updated. It says 2019 and even less so one to three years. So it would take 2,500 qubits to break elliptic curve encryption and 4,000 qubits to break RSA encryption. But I wanna point out that these are perfect logical qubits. And actually we need a lot more physical qubits because we need a lot of error correction for Shor's algorithm. The quantum error correction overhead is actually really big. And some estimates say that it would take maybe 10 million qubits. And even the lowest estimates say millions of qubits to get to the point that we could do Shor's algorithm on these sort of key sizes. And also remember that different types of quantum hardware actually need different types of error correction and different overhead. So even the qubits that can maybe scale a lot faster than other hardware systems, they're going to need a lot more error correction probably, and they might have other challenges. So even though something is growing really quickly, the quantum computer computing error correction overhead might be a lot larger. So Machimo actually uses this EU's PQ Crypto's approved Watts, which is this Winternet's one-time signature scheme, which I just talked about. And like I mentioned, these hash-based signature schemes are seem to be resistant to quantum computing attacks. They also say here that we checked out the algorithms that were peer-reviewed and acknowledged by the EU-backed quantum research group PQ Crypto and chose the Watts algorithm, the Watts Plus algorithm. So first, I want to talk about this PQ Crypto group. It's actually a very legitimate group with advisors like Dr. Mosca, who is at University of Waterloo. It's really a top quantum school and is deeply involved in quantum cryptography research. And actually, his videos were some of the first videos I found many, many years ago when I started looking into quantum cryptography. However, I will say that this PQ Crypto website recommendations haven't really been updated in a while since 2015. While there hasn't really been anything that would dramatically change the recommendations, this algorithm hasn't been broken or anything, but it'd be interesting to see recent updates since this field is moving so quickly. And I think not even from the quantum side, but from the classical computing side. They also now say on their website, we then wrote and vetted our quantum code with the algorithm's originator, Andreas Holsing. Sorry if I pronounced that wrong. That's awesome. I don't know what wrote and vetted means, if they rolled their own encryption or they use some package that's actually trusted. The one big thing in security training that I've ever done for software engineering is don't roll your own crypto. And it's almost always best practice to actually use the approved packages for this. But however, maybe there's no official Watts Plus implementation available when Moshimo was created. So maybe that's why they did their own or they didn't want to trust an external package. I can't pronounce Machimo. I'm sorry about that. I did find an article that actually mentioned that this creator actually wrote a paper called The Review of Machimo's Watts Implementation, but I couldn't actually find the original. So it looks like they wrote their own implementation. So here's what the article talked about uh, was quoted, but if anyone has the original paper, please actually comment below and reach out, let me know where it is. So it says, we analyzed the C implementation of Watts provided by Mochimo. We did not find any bugs or security issues on the core implementation in the slash Watts subfolder. Under the assumption that the code provided in the example.c shows how the signature scheme is used to sign transactions, we identified several issues worth reconsideration. At least one issue weakens the security of the used signature scheme. So it looks like they're using a hash-based scheme, but there might be some implementation issues.
Next, let's talk about IOTA. IOTA is not claiming quantum security on its homepage right now. However, ages ago, there were claims that IOTA was the only quantum resistant cryptocurrency. That obviously isn't true because we talked about the other cryptocurrencies already, but it's interesting they're actually moving away from post quantum encryption. IOTA was completely relaunched recently in April 2021 with the IOTA 1.5 called Chrysalis. And among other updates, that's actually when the quantum security was ditched. So their protocol actually used the Watts signature scheme as well. However, Watts does have some drawbacks and it looks like IOTA ran into some of these issues that really exacerbated their security issues, leading to a pretty big wallet hack. The reason they stated for the hack is this. The vulnerability in the previous version of IOTA's wallet was due to third-party integration. It's interesting to me, they're not using third-party integration anymore. On one hand, that's great. On the other hand, for cryptocurrency and things that are very important like that, maybe relying on a trusted library is good. It's very hard to build something very secure unless you have your own research team, which some of these cryptocurrencies actually really do. And uh, third-party libraries, you know, from very trusted sources are better if you don't have that expertise. IOTA's cryptography only allowed you to use a wallet address once. Reusing a wallet address can actually be a huge Point of vulnerability as well. If you reuse wallet addresses, it means that that private key attached to that wallet address can be used to sign transactions again. And that means if you reuse the address way in the future when we have quantum computers and it's the same one, you can actually use a transaction really long in the past to recover that private key. Of course, again, right now that's safe. We don't have quantum computers that large, but it's something to think about. So this new release actually used the ED25519 signature scheme, which is the Edwards Curve Digital Signature Algorithm. And it actually does give a lot of positives to the IOTA tech because it's faster and it reduces transaction size. It is, however, not quantum safe. It's very vulnerable to quantum computers. Quantum computers are exponentially fast at solving this. So breaking keys that would take millions of years actually can come down to seconds on a quantum computer if we have a large enough quantum system. However, this team actually believes that they can adopt a new signature scheme very, very quickly. So they're gonna wait for the recommendations to come out once there's a viable recommendation and then upgrade. So here the point is IOTA did at one point use quantum secure crypto, but is no longer using that. So there's other cryptocurrencies that are also getting into the research side of things, even if they haven't implemented anything yet. Cardano, for example, actually did research a few years ago in conjunction with a think tank to explore what it would mean for cryptocurrencies if we get a large enough quantum computer. They've also continued publishing work on quantum security in the last couple of years, so I'm definitely keeping an eye on the space and this website because some of the latest papers here were on the Watts Plus signature scheme, so it's really gaining popularity, at least in the crypto space. I personally really enjoyed reading through the archive, but remember I'm a physicist, I'm not a computer scientist, so some of these things were a little bit over my head, but I think a lot of the work is really impressive, so again, I'm going to be keeping an eye on the research that's coming out through here. So in general, a lot of these cryptocurrencies are using things that are pretty legit. So these hash-based signature schemes, as far as we know, are pretty good about standing up to attacks from quantum computers, even in the face of Grover's algorithm. So in late 2016, NIST actually started running a competition to find post-quantum encryption schemes, and they're getting to the end part of that competition. And they've really found about 26 candidate algorithms that went through the next phase, and they're starting to narrow those down now. These algorithms had a few different approaches, but they mostly lay in three families, lattice-based, error correcting, and multivariate cryptography. Lattice space systems are actually the ones that have the largest body of work behind them for about 25 years. So we're thinking that those could maybe be the algorithms that eventually get recommended. So right now they're actually testing and narrowing down these encryption standards. And they said in 2022 through 2024, that's when they're gonna release their final results. So now let me know what you think. Are you worried about quantum computers and are you getting out of Bitcoin? So as promised, this is my cryptocurrency portfolio. And so as you see, I'm still in plenty of cryptocurrencies that do have vulnerabilities to quantum systems. And I also wanna add as a disclaimer, some people get really pressed about some things in my portfolio. I've been investing in crypto since 20 2015. So these are not recommendations on what to invest in. I made some mistakes back in the past. I rarely actually sell any of my cryptocurrency. I did once this year when I got into Doge, when it jumped up a little bit. So I made some money off that. And in 2017, I sold some Ethereum during, or sorry, some Bitcoin during the big pump up and kind of recovered my initial investment time.
times a good amount. I haven't in the end actually sold anything besides that. I've been kind of keeping it and actually adding more to my portfolio over time. And again, this is not financial advice. I've been in the space for a really long time. And so I got a hate comment about one of the forks of Bitcoin that I had in my portfolio. And I was like, oh, that's a weird thing to say. Like you weren't in Bitcoin during time. Like I got it because I was there during the fork. That's why I have it. So but even though I have all these quantum vulnerable coins in my portfolio, in my opinion, quantum computers are a legitimate threat to cryptocurrencies, just not right now. This is over the long term. And honestly, even scientists right now disagree on how long it'll take until we have a large enough quantum computer to break RSA and elliptic curve encryption. However, the nice thing about cryptocurrencies is that we can actually update them pretty quickly compared to some older systems like banks. I'm a little bit worried about banks, but there are some consequences still of this upgrade that we have to think about. And check out my video. I already made one about those where I talk a little bit about reusing wallets and confirmation times and other points of attack. And as we've seen, some of these cryptocurrencies are aware and are working towards the threat and actually are putting in real research into quantum secure encryption. I'm currently not worried that there's a quantum computer out there that's large enough to actually crack encryption, so I'm keeping it all in my portfolio. But if anything changes, I'll let you know, so make sure to subscribe to my channel.